I'm going to tell you a couple interesting stories to uh, loosen you up a little bit and then trace the history of where we are and why we are. Uh, one just little anecdote is uh, raise your hand if anybody here has read the 70-year-old Sinclair Lewis novel, Aerosmith. A few of you have. Well, uh, Scott Armstrong and I found out that that book guided our entire life in science. If you uh, read a novel a year, go back 70 years and, and uh, find out how science uh, drives a true scientist, something we see uh, uh, very few of, and I think you'll uh, enjoy it. But it was interesting in chatting with Scott that both our lives were dramatically influenced by a simple novel about a, uh, a doctor whose life uh, was dedicated to uh, ultimately to research, as ours have been. Uh, the second uh, little story you may or may not know is uh, you heard Scott talk about Occam's razor, and probably everybody here has heard the term, and they have a general idea what it is. But the, the term razor uh, used century, Occam is someone who lived uh, centuries ago, and uh, a razor back in ancient times was basically a theorem, a truism that you might have, uh, for instance, in uh, geometry. And my favorite uh, Occam razor story, you will not soon forget this, uh, is that if you're walking in a farm field here in the United States and you hear hoofbeats behind you, make the assumption that it's horses and not zebras. Well, uh, many of you know that I'm a very serious skydiver. I hold a world skydiving record for stupidity. I, I didn't miss a single month a few years back, went 34 years and 11 months without missing a month of skydiving. Well, one day I went out of a plane, this is about five years ago, I went out of a plane at uh, 13,000 feet and I uh, I misread the ground in terms of where I went out of the plane. I misread the winds, and I landed about five miles from where I was hoping to land in a farm field, and I heard hoofbeats behind me. And I turned around, and it was zebras. Uh, <laughs> honest to God, it really, it was a farmer that had wild animals, but I'll, I won't forget that as long as I live. I want to trace for you the uh, history I heard. Dennis mentioned 1895. Our whole problem began in, 1980, in 1895 when Savanti Arrhenius, a European uh, scientist, uh, determined that carbon dioxide does indeed have an impact on uh, temperature, that it absorbs heat, and uh, Therefore, it was a greenhouse gas. Uh, actually, in his writings, Savanti Arrhenius felt that was a wonderful thing, and uh, warmth was a very positive uh, factor in our lives, which, of course, it is. Uh, in case you haven't checked, we're now fairly sure that nine times more people die prematurely from cold uh, than from heat. And it was, if you were in the economic uh, lecture, uh, Dr. Mendelssohn, you know, mentioned uh, while he was calculating the social cost of carbon dioxide, uh, he was quite sure, as I am, that we will be facing uh, colder weather in the coming decades, which will be more of a problem. However, we'll adapt. Uh, we will we'll work it out. Uh, the next major date of where we're going was 1980, 1990, when IPCC formed a committee of the United Nations not to study climate change, not to determine why the climate changed, but entirely to determine man's role in warming the planet. That was their directive. That's all they've ever done. It was never an open uh, scientific thing. And they ignored from the outset that carbon dioxide was much higher in, in centuries and thousands of years past, and it had no impact on slowing the ice ages that we have uh, experienced. They started building these uh, mathematical models that have only disagreed with each other, have never been able to predict the future or even predict backwards in the past when we had 
all the data. It's those IPC reports that really develop the concept of consensus science. There is no such thing as consensus science. It is insane to think that you can vote that something is correct. Einstein, a, a bunch of scientists uh, wrote a book. I can't remember who published it, but the title of the book was 100 Scientists That Disagree with Einstein. Einstein responded in saying it, it would only take one to disagree if he could prove that. By the way, you're probably looking at the only person you will ever meet from now on who actually knew Albert Einstein. I was joking this morning that I was around when the dinosaurs were here. Uh, I, I was, of course, but I actually had a nodding acquaintance with Albert Einstein. Pretty much every morning, uh, he went up the sidewalk to uh, work in his laboratory at Princeton, and I went down the sidewalk uh, to, to class. When I say we had a nodding acquaintance, that was it. I nodded, he nodded, and, and <laughs> but it's still exciting. It, it's still exciting to me. Now, global warming is like so many other things that we faced in history. Uh, it may shock you that a doctor by the name of Semmelweis a couple hundred years ago could not convince doctors when they moved from the morgue to the birthing room to wash their hands. And something called purple fever was common uh, with women uh, giving birth. It took 20 years for him to convince the doctors to wash their hands. It took Louis Pasteur 50 years to convince medical science of the germ theory, the, the, the theories of how disease was passed uh, really insane historically. Now, we've already talked about we got to get rid of the endangerment uh, situation. We need a new EPA. We have to withdraw uh, from Paris. Um, we're, right now, we're facing Robert Kennedy Jr. wants to try everybody in this room for war crimes. That's a fact. Uh, Leonard Leonardo DiCaprio who is a high school dropout is now teaching science to the federal government. I mean, that's where we are. But it, it, it really started with, uh, with good intent. Um, and as I said, or, or mentioned, maybe I said it this morning, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I did say it with regard to Senator Inhofe. Uh, I am largely responsible with four other people. There were five of us, the other four probably aren't alive now or they're retired, but they're not active, surely for developing the whole concept of uh, EPA from 68 to 71. Uh, we succeeded, as you know, Nixon signed the law for an EPA uh, in 1971, and it was really not a bad agency uh, to begin with. We passed seven laws that I think are all on the screen in the 70s, and I, I actually had played a role in writing them all. They were sensible. I testified before Congress in the 70s uh, a couple dozen times trying to explain uh, what environmental problems were, whether it was air pollution or surface water pollution or groundwater pollution uh, or, or mining uh, problems or agricultural chemical problems. Uh, the, the Congress had no clue, no clue. So we lectured to them and we were able to get seven laws that were really quite good. The only law that wasn't quite good was the uh, Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act that you all know as Superfund. That law ran off the uh, rails in about 1980. Since 1980, I can tell you there has not been a single environmental law passed that advanced the cause of environmental protection in the United States. And at that point, the Environmental Protection Agency became a wholly owned subsidiary of the green movement. I mean, it was truly weaponized against society. And it remains that way today. Uh, hopefully, Scott Pruitt will uh, move it in the right direction. It won't be easy. It's hard to get rid of federal employees. If I had my druthers, I would uh, have every all 15,000 of the people working in Washington and in the 10 districts come in and talk to me for five minutes. I would certainly fire 90% of them based on my five-minute interview with them. But that isn't going to happen. It's going to be a slow uh, process. Um, within uh, EPA, 
There are 14 offices. I'm going to show you all of them. Two of them, read them. Do, do those two offices belong in EPA? Who runs the, uh, our, our work with Indian tribes in the United States? What's the name of it? The Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA. Why are those two offices not in the Bureau of Indian Affairs? Well, let me go back a little further. Uh, many of you know that uh, uh, two years ago I wrote a plan uh, to devolve EPA over a period of five years and turn over all the responsibilities to a committee of the whole of the 50 states, which you heard Dennis uh, mention. Um, I initially wrote that plan or began to write the plan for Romney, but the politicians got involved and just totally destroyed it. Uh, two years ago in Las Vegas, I'd been working on it for years. I was to be a keynote speaker at the end of a two-day session, and all the speakers before me were just amazing. And I had written a pretty much plain vanilla speech, and I was concerned that I was going to really come off looking bad uh, to the audience that had heard four great speakers, as we're hearing here. And uh, I said, I've got I've to do something different. And uh, my friend uh, Dick Geyer was sitting with me, a classmate, and I said, Dick, do you think I dare uh, talk about my plan to get rid of EPA? And uh, he said, sure, go for it. So I asked Joe Bast on the way out of the room that afternoon. I was going to keynote the next morning. I said, Joe, do you know what I'm talking about tomorrow morning? He said, no. I said, do you care? He said, no. <laughs> well, uh, that gave me uh, the license to talk about it. And then later on, I met Nancy Thorner, who's sitting in the front row, and I told her about what I was doing. And she said, go for it, because I was kind of scared. And I presented the plan, which now everybody in Congress and all the states has a copy of it. And the fascinating thing about it is that there has never been a criticism. I'm going to kind of show it to you very quickly in the last next few minutes. But there's never been a criticism of the plan in terms of this isn't practical or you can't do that. Not one. Uh, people just say it'll never happen. You don't get rid of federal agencies, and that may or may not be true. But the only criticism was it's a five-year plan, the idea not to throw people out of work on the street without you know, reasonable notice. And the only criticism is why can't you do it in a year? Why do you need five years to get rid of EPA? Well, because I'm a, a nice guy, and, and I don't want to throw people out of work. I want to give them uh, a chance. And so here are the 14 offices, each with their own budget, their own manpower. You just saw two of them, the two Indian groups. Do you think any of these offices that have large manpower and large budgets do any science? They're all administrators. They do no useful work whatsoever. So over the five years, we get rid of a couple of them at a time, giving them chances to find uh, new jobs. And we form, I uh, actually, I wanted to form <coughs> the new office of EPA in Topeka, Kansas, because it's a geographic center. Dennis worked in Topeka for a long time, said, no, it's a horrible place to put EPA. So we're looking for a Midwest town. All of the, the, basically, most of the cabinet positions in our government should not be located in Washington. Uh, if you deal with uh, HUD and housing and urban development, it ought to be in Detroit. It ought to be where the problems are. And uh, if you're in Washington, the lobbyists just run everything. They run roughshod over you. So I think EPA should be moved into the middle of the country, and it should become an, a, a committee of the whole. And the plan was that each state would contribute six employees, giving 300 employees. Uh, their work would be divided up in accordance with the things that EPA has to do. And over a 10-year period, because it would take 10 years, they would analyze every EPA regulation. Those that were actually congressional laws, they would say it's good or bad or indifferent and send a recommendation back to the Congress. Those which are executive orders, which are 80% of what controls our environment, they would have the right, as our president now is doing, getting rid of things by executive order, they'd have the right to get rid of them by a two-thirds vote of the 50 states. Uh, the budget, let's go down. Those are the only, agent, the only offices doing science. And all of their work would be slowly, they would be phased out last in the last four to fifth year, 
with the responsibilities going to various committees of the Committee of the Whole. And uh, they, would, they would rule over everything. It would take quite a while uh, to get it done. The budget for EPA is $8.2 billion. The manpower, 15000 Essentially, everybody could be eliminated, except for the research. They have a few research labs that could still operate. Uh, they may take up uh, a little bit of money, perhaps a billion dollars. And a billion dollars in grants would be given to the 50 states. $20 million would go to each state to uh, you know, allow them to send six people to the new office in the center of our country and to beef up the work they're doing. They do 100% of the work. I'm going to show you the only project I'm familiar with that the federal government has done in recent years uh, in a moment. There it is. <laughs> there it is. The, uh, the EPA does nothing. They do no useful work. They just look over the shoulder and make life miserable for the states. But uh, last year, there was a, a break of a, of a barrier uh, and a mining operation that uh, uh, allowed some pollution to escape. And I don't know how it happened, but the federal government puffed out their chest, and we're going to send the feds in, and we're going to take it over from the Colorado Environmental Protection Agency. And that was the result. They had a little p pollution. They contaminated the Animus River uh, for well over a month. The EPA, in its current form, is useless. Uh, we've got to get rid of it. Now, do it in stages here. As I said, get rid of the Indian Affairs, uh, phase out the other groups uh, over time, forming the Committee of the Whole. But the most important thing to understand is that it was really a great idea to form EPA originally. And why did we need it? The states did not have agencies. It took 10 years after the development of EPA and the writing of the seven laws I mentioned, it took 10 years for the states to take over what we call primacy, to take over the administration of all the, the new environmental laws that were, were definitely needed. But once every state had an EPA with a staff, with knowledge to take over the responsibilities for administering all those laws, we, we have not needed a U.S. EPA ever since. I can argue we don't need a U.S. Department of Energy. We don't need a U.S. Department of Education. There are other lectures, but I'm sure there are people here that understand it's a similar, similar problem. It goes against the Constitution. Constitution called for four agencies, a cabinet of four. We needed a Treasury. We needed a State Department. Uh, we needed a military, and I can't think of the fourth. Most of you probably will. Okay. Uh, that was it. Well, so ever, essentially every agency of the federal government which took away power from the states was against the Constitution, not intended by the Founding Fathers. We're suffering for it ever since. I'm incredibly optimistic. I was amazed that I didn't get a single giggle this morning when twice I referred to Trump's eight years in office. <laughs> I'm very confident that at the end of eight years, uh, things are going to be a hell of a lot better with regard to every single department of the federal government. Thank you.